Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSEC, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment So we all can figure it out What it's all about It's the Homework Homework Hotline. I'm Joe Zaniga. And I'm Sam Simpson. Homework Hotline is the place where you get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. Now for more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games and other online resources and the latest episodes of our show. All right, we want to know what you think about this topic. What would your personal mascot or symbol be and why? Would it reflect who you are? Would you, would you include interests, talents, or skills? Hmm, you can weigh in on this topic and tell us what you think by visiting us on Facebook and leaving us a message or tweeting at us using the hashtag HHVoiceIt or by visiting our website, homeworkhotline.org and clicking on the Voice It button. Remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on the air and the answer will be shared on Wednesday's Homework Hotline. All right, now before we get into our science challenge in just a second, We'd like to remind you that a little later in the show, Tim Cotley from the Ratchet Museum and Science Center will be here with us doing <laughs> a science experiment that involves bananas and strawberries. And today is Thursday, and that means it's time for our science challenge. What do you have for us this week? All right, Sam, so I got okay. our vacuum pump that we've been using the last yep. couple weeks again, and we started heating some water, yep. and it looks like it's close to 90 degrees. So let me okay. do this so we can uh, see if this uh, does okay. So we're at... Um, we're close, all right, okay, camera. so we can see the temperature there. So it's not quite boiling yet, but it's getting warm. Yes, it is. All right, so I'm gonna put it over here on the pump, and I'm gonna use our all right. tongs to move it. If you wanna turn that off, Sam, we won't need to okay. add heat so we don't, don't burn, burn ourselves. Don't burn Yep, <laughs> thank all you. Right. And I'll put this on, and I'm gonna have you turn on the vacuum pump. Okay. Let me see if I can get, oop. Get it, uh, okay. Right, ready? Yep, yep, I think I got it. Oh, nope, I didn't. All right, now we should get it. Okay, so we'll give it a minute to. Ah, uh... oh, thank you for holding that on. Yeah. Somehow we're not. Uh... I think we got a leak here someplace. We're not. We got a leak? I think so. I hear it, but I don't. Is the valve open? Yeah. Sure, it worked before. <laughs> Well, that's science. Yeah. What do you want to do? Uh, I'm going to give it a second. If not, we'll have to talk about what should have happened. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah, you got it back on there, don't you? Yeah. But it's not going down. Let's try once we turn it off for a second, Sam. Let's retry it because uh, it definitely worked before when you... Yeah, that didn't work at all. Let's try again. Let me move it. And... Uh, this is science, guys. Yeah. Doesn't always work the first sure. time. Sure, the practice worked. <laughs> let's try one more time. Okay. And now that's all fogged up in there. Oh, there's better. Okay, now it's going down. I don't know what was going on. Ah, and we see already that it's starting to boil. Notice that our, our water is boiling in here. And we, didn't, we didn't add any heat. Turn it off? Yes, thank you, Sam. All right, Ooh, we didn't add any heat. But boy, that certainly started to boil right away, didn't it? Yeah. All right, we didn't add heat. We did lower the pressure. We've talked about what our vacuum pump does. Mm -hmm. All right. And so our sandwich challenge for tonight is going to be what conditions are necessary for the liquid to boil? Now, this was just plain water, but what's necessary? Again, our science challenge for tonight is what conditions are necessary for the liquid to boil? Hmm. If you think you can solve the science challenge, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer on our website, homerickhotline.org. Answer correctly and you can have a chance to share that answer at the end of the show. But every Kirk response way at our Homework Hotline Hall of Fame, at enough points you can win a tablet at the end of the season. You know what I think it was, Sam? I knew you helped me there. This uh, rubber ring doesn't that fit seal. quite tight. I think okay. we got it finally, so thanks for your help. You're welcome. <laughs> right. Throughout March, Homework Hotline will be celebrating Women's History Month. Tonight, we'll be finishing up our week on Nevertheless, She Persisted. 
All right, today we'll look at women that have continued to fight and succeed in bringing positive change to the lives of diverse American women. Okay, I've got one of those women I want to talk about. All right, great. Come on over to the board with me. Today I want to talk a little bit about, or share with you a little bit about, Sally Ride. Who was Sally Ride? She was a physicist and an astronaut. To me, some really cool stuff. To be a physicist is cool. To be an astronaut is cool. To be both is really cool. So this is quite a lady here. A little bit about her early life. Um, she had one sister. Uh, her mother used to actually help out in a correctional facility as a counselor. And her father was a, a political science professor. She graduated from, from a school for girls that she went to on a scholarship. One of the things that's very interesting about her is she was a nationally ranked tennis player when she was in high school. Very impressive. So if she didn't become a physicist, well, she could have been a physicist, an astronaut, and a professional tennis player. Wow. She went on to Swarthmore College. She went there for, oh, about a year and a half, and then she, there she took some physics courses. And then she went to the University of California, University of California, Los Angeles, before she transferred to Stanford University as a junior, where she got her bachelor's degree in English and physics. Then she went on to get her master's and her doctorate degree. Her kind of focus was astrophysics, and free electron lasers. That's some pretty heavy stuff. I loved astrophysics. That's all the stuff that deals with like space. So yeah, astrophysics, space, astronaut makes a lot of sense. Um, this little thing that I, and, and finding out a little bit about her, what really surprised me is when I found this out and I thought, is that really true? It says that Ride was one of 8,000 people who answered an advertisement while she was at Stan while she was in the Stanford, while she was at Stanford in the newspaper to join NASA, and she was accepted. That doesn't seem kind of becoming an astronaut off an ad in a college newspaper, but that's what it said. During her career, what she did was, she did a, a number of things while she was um, working at, at, at NASA. One of the things, she was the capsule communicator for the second and third space shuttle flights. She also um, helped develop that robot arm. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Challenger where they, the arm goes out and grab things. So she was part of the, um, the development of that actual uh, um, apparatus. And then on June 18, 1983, she became the first American woman in space as part of the Challenger. Um, and she was also the first woman to use that robot arm. Part of that is because there were a couple of Russian astronauts who had went up before her. So she wasn't the first woman, but she was the first American woman. What I found to be really cool, the second flight, so she didn't go to space once, she went to space twice. The second time in 1984, she was on Challenger again, and she was up there for over 343 hours. That's like over 15 days, or approximately 15 days in space. Wow, I'm thinking of all the views she saw, all, up that, all of that up in space. A little bit about her life after NASA. Um, she went to work to Stanford at Stanford University. And after that, she became a, prof a professor of physics at the University of California in San Diego, uh, where she was the director of the California Space Institute. She also led two public outreach programs for, uh, for NASA. And for those programs, what she was doing is she was trying to get high school girls, particularly high school and middle school girls, interested in science. She was also started her own company that did some of the same kinds of things. And what I also found to be interesting, she either wrote or co-wrote seven children's books all around math and science. She received a lot of awards and honors. Here are just a few. She received the National, science, uh, National Space Science Society Award, the Lindbergh Eagle Award, the NCAA Theodore Roosevelt Award, she also received um, uh, NASA's flight medal twice, because she went to space twice. And she has two elementary schools named after her. She received um, the Samuel B. Beard Award for the greatest public service by an individual 
35 and under. She was inducted, to, inducted into a number of places. The National Women's Hall of Fame, the Astronaut Hall of Fame, California Hall of Fame, the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Really, really came. I put this together because there's a bunch of things. Did you know they were thinking about putting her not on the $50 bill, but on the $10 bill? Cool. She was also on the Muffets. She's got a Lego portrait of her out there, too. And of course, she was on the cover of Newsweek. Wow, pretty impressive. So, Sally Ride, a, phys a physicist and an astronaut. She flew on the Orbiter Challenger twice. She's the first American woman in space and the youngest American astronaut to have traveled to space. Fortunately, she passed away from cancer in, 19, in 2012. So that's a little bit about Sally Ride, astronaut and physicist. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion with the same direction and speed unless interfered with. And now we'd like to wel welcome Tim Crawley from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. What do you have for hey us guys. tonight? Good to Hi, see Tim. you. Good to see you. Well, because Good. at the museum we have the genome exhibit, I thought we would do something on DNA. Great. Great. And the other cool thing is, it's an experiment that kids can do at home really pretty easy. We're going to extract DNA from both a banana and from some strawberries. All Experiments. Right. Sam, you're right, Experiments. In the, you're, right, you're right in the, uh, okay. the driver's seat. All so right. we're going to help it out. What we're going to do is, first thing is we'll start by breaking down, if we can open up this bag. Okay. Hold that there. All right. We'll give you your banana part. Give me some okay. banana. Yep, cool banana. Now we'll right. break it up. That's probably good. And turn around, I'm going to get some strawberries. What you want to do is close that up, burp a little bit of the air out of it maybe, right, and then, just to make it a little easier, and then start mashing that up. And I'm going to talk up. about nice. how the kids can do it easy at home. So I've let's got talk the, about what, what, did you, what do you have in here, Tim? Oh, we've got, it's actually a lysis buffer. It's mm -hmm. salt water and basically dishwashing liquid. Which will break down the cell membranes. So the dishwashing the liquid breaks yep. down the lipids on the outside of the cell membranes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this, break this down first so that it's a little more squishy before I put in the liquid. Now, when you want to make it at home, it's pretty easy. You take about a third of a cup of water, give or take, about a teaspoon of salt, mix it in with the water, and then add a few, two, three drops of liquid soap. You okay. can use hand soap, dishwashing soap. Mm -hmm. I'm using hand soap right now. And it's pretty good because it's a little bit clear, and we'll be able to see how this works out. So right now, let me put, they say three tablespoons, so that'll be nine of these teaspoons with uh, three teaspoons per tablespoon. <laughs> I'm guessing. Just, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and in science, of course, you've always got the, uh, that's about right. Yeah. That's about right. So I'm going to pour this in there, right? You're going to take that, and once you got it, you got it pretty well mashed up. You're way ahead okay. of me. Once you get it pretty much so mashed up, you want to take the, uh, if I can steal that from you. Okay. Sorry, though. Yep. And pour it through there, because what you want to do strain is strain it. Strain it. Right. Now, you can use a coffee filter. You can do it with, with a paper towel. It works, but the coffee filter works a Probably lot works easier. a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So we'll turn around. Now you, what you want to do is wait for it. You can wait for it to drip down or scoop it all up, and make a little tea bag type shape to one it. One of these things, huh? And hold it. Now when you squeeze it, especially with the coffee filter, you want to squeeze it gently as you work your way down. Because you don't want to make a mess. Because it'll, yeah. it'll break on you. Yeah, you don't want the Let me see. Mine may not do it, but we'll find out. I got a backup just in case. All right. Because the strawberry takes a little bit more mashing, but I'm gonna go ahead. And now while we're straining this all out, uh, well, spilled some in there. Is that gonna be right. okay? You know okay. what? Just do take it again. Yeah. Do it again. That's I'm gonna why. take this. Put that Follow in there. with the pay raises. You bet. <laughs> this time, it should go through a lot easier. A lot easier and a lot less to catch. Yeah, this time. And that's time. all right because it happens like that yeah. all the time. <laughs> and next thing, once. You got yours. I'm going to take mine 
and you take a little rubbing alcohol. Now, a lot of times it asks for it to be chilled, okay. mm -hmm. and so mine I put in the, in the freezer for a, an hour or so, and I'm gonna put it in here. I'm just gonna let mine set. Okay, and? Because it'll separate as we go along. Okay. And I'm gonna pour just about the same amount as you have mm -hmm. liquid in there. Now, when you, what you wanna do, Sam, is you wanna stir it, but really, really gently. slowly. Gently, you can do it right up here, and okay. you should be able to see it. Well, I can see stuff even already. Slower, even slower, even, even slower. slower. Mm -hmm. That's why with kids, you tell them, because it's really important to go kind of slow. Oh, I can see it all coagulating there. Mm -hmm. yep. On this one, if you really, if we were to zone in on it, wow. you can see it already. You can see in here, it's starting to turn around. That All that floaty stuff, that is DNA. And actually, through the wonders of television, I had a setup down here, and it may have broken up, but, ah, uh, there you go. Wow. And that's what it looks like. If you've got something that looks like snot, you've got it. <laughs> looks that's like snot. That's what I always tell. That's that right. looks good. Those there. are strands. Let's see how yours came out. Usually you can just, oh, you may have beat yours up a little bit more. And okay. And let's talk, you know, we didn't say what DNA is, oh. but DNA is the molecule in your chromosome that actually carries your, your heredity. It has okay. your uh, genetic makeup. We talked about genes, but your genes but and uh, can, chromosomes are made of the DNA. That up. You can yeah. see it there. Yeah, you can see so, it all in there. The banana comes out really pretty well. The slower you turn, the more it stays together. And mm -hmm. you think we're very individual, we're very unique as humans, yeah. but 60% of the DNA, DNA in this banana is the same DNA that's in us. Wow. And chimpanzees were... a lot of were, conservation, about 98%. 98%. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's so it's cool. a lot of the yeah. same. But right. it's really, it's a great demo that kids can try at home. And you can pull DNA from a lot of different things. Bananas are easy, strawberries are cool. cool. All right, well thanks, Tim. Now we want to thank Tim for being here tonight. But thanks. to learn more about the Rochester Museum Science Center, head to our website, homeworkhotline.org. But stay there right now, we'll be back in just a second. Cool. Okay. My very excellent mother just served us noodles. This mnemonic device or memory tool can help you remember the order of the planets in our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. All right, you talked about an astronaut. I'm going to talk about something that had to do with flying, but okay. not quite the same. Not right. space travel. Yeah. Huh? No. All right. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, Catherine uh, Marquez. Now, I've got this map up here because she actually is from Bolivia, okay, down here in South America is actually where she did her work. And, you know, she's holding a bat there. And here's kind of the interesting thing that she did. Now, she was born in Bolivia in, 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 in uh, 1983. Okay, grew up in Bolivia. She got her undergrad there, and then she got a master's degree in biology, but actually she also got one in conservation of tropical areas. And that was the, one of the interesting things she did. In 2006, her and another woman located a Bolivian sword-nosed bat. Now, what's so special about that, we'll look at it in a minute, but you can see why this guy is called the sword-nosed bat. This is uh, holding that bat, you can see the little the protuberance it has out of, its, out of its nose there. All right, this is his Latin name. Remember, they're always capitalized uh, genus, lowercase species. But this is that bat. And what was special about this bat, that it was thought to be extinct in Bolivia. Nobody had seen one in 72 years, and they discovered this one. So the area where they had has since become a, a nature preserve. It's protected, and it's the first place in Latin America that actually was designated as an area, to, as a protection area for bats. So that was cool that she discovered this bat that was thought to have been distinct in that area, excuse me, extinct in that area, and was able to get that area protected so that those uh, bats would persevere. Now let's talk a little bit about bats, because bats are kind of cool. You know, we talk about them at Halloween, you know, we think of the bats, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there about bats. Bats are mammals. So like us and other mammals, they have hair, they give birth to live young, the mothers nurse their young. But a lot of people think of bats as mice with wings, think they're related to mice, and they're not. They're not rodents at all, so they're no more related to mice than they are to us. 
They're actually a, a separate order altogether called Chiroptera, and they're the only members of that, uh, of that order. And the kind of cool thing about bats, if you think about it, they're one of only four times that flight has evolved. We know of birds that, that can fly, we know of insects that can fly, we have bats, and then the ancient uh, um, the pterosaurs and the ancient reptiles are flight, but that's the only five, five, four times that flight has evolved. Now, a lot of people also think that bats are blind. They're not. Some have poor eyesight, many have very good eyesight, but they don't need that eyesight when they use their echolocation, that they, they're fine in the dark. Most of them are nocturnal, but they're not only out at night. Some actually are out to the, in the day, and especially the twilight times. And the other thing that I want to talk a little bit about bats in this area are actually going having some problems with something that's called white nose syndrome, but actually it's a fungal disease that affects these, these bats. And it's easy for them to transfer it between themselves because they think about bats, you know, we hear about bat case and stuff. They do communicate or they do uh, congregate in groups, and it's easy for a fungal disease like this to be transferred from one to the other. The other thing you occasionally hear about bats is them being rabid. Now, not all bats are rabid, but that's another disease that's easily transferred from one another when they hang together in these, in these, in these communes. So that's a little bit about bats themselves. Now, go back to, uh, to our, our young lady here, Ms. Marquez. She was, um, in 2007, she got a, a grant to, stu uh, to study in Panama from the Smithsonian, and she worked with bats. And she was focusing on, at that time, how bats were affected by the borders of their tra territories. So she also looked at the islands, too. Place where they, the forest where they lived came in contact with either grasslands or in the waters, and she started looking at how, how they were affected by those habitats. Then in 2009, the National Geographic Society gave her some money and she started studying ectoparasites. Now what's an ectoparasite? We know parasite is something that, that benefits from living off as hosts, and ectoparasites are ones that actually live on the outside of hosts. So for example, if you get a, a bacterial disease, that's one kind of parasite, but if you get bit by a mosquito, that's an ectoparasite. And so what she actually studied was these bats in the savannas, and she um, identified over 20 kinds of mites and ticks that actually preyed on these bats. And that work still continues to this day. So she studied these, these ectoparasites. Now, since 2010, she's traveled to many countries teaching about bats and some of the um, things about their bioacoustics and the benefits of bats. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of those bat benefits. When we think of the insect eating bat, uh, bats, some of those can eat almost their weight in mosquitoes in an evening. So they're involved in pest control. Some of the fruit eating bats, um, when they defecate, they spread the seeds, but many things are pollinated by bats. It's kind of funny, Tim just did an experiment for us with bananas, but if it wasn't for bats, bananas, guavas, aguave, mangoes, ma ma mango, mangoes are all things that are pollinated, not by what we think of, you know, pollination, we think of uh, bees, but they're actually pollinated by these bats that, that visit their flowers. So the flowers that are pollinated by bats often are light in color because it's at night that they do their pollination larger and have a lot of nectar that draw these bats in. Now, um, in 2012, she got a, a fellowship to study the ultrasound spectrum of bats. That's sounds that are higher than we can hear. And she continues to work on her PhD in both Spain and Bolivia. And you know, she's um, looked at the, the calls of the bats and found that it's their, not just the call itself, but the frequency of the, how often it break, breaks up. And all this would tell whether the bat was actually hunting or not. So she's done a lot of work with bats. And luckily for the bats that she's done this because she's, uh, she's saved a lot of them. Here's a fun saying to help you remember the basic needs of the human body. Oh, can Venus flies make pretty webs? This actually helps you remember oxygen, carbohydrates, vitamins, fats, minerals, protein, water. All right, Sam, cool. we got a winner our science challenge. Hello, Caleb. Hi. Caleb, what's going on here? What has to happen for something to boil? Um, a liquid in a partial vacuum has a lower boiling point than when the liquid, liquid is at atmospheric pressure. At that temperature, the vapor pressure of the liquid becomes sufficient to overcome atmospheric pressure and allow bubbles of vapor to form inside the bulk of liquid. You got it. So it's the vapor pressure. Now, vapor pressure is the pressure of that liquid trying to turn to a gas. And when we see when it's boiling, we see bubbles coming up from everywhere, right? 
And so, yeah. and so what has to happen for it to boil is the, the vapor pressure has to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. Now we're used to heating things up, which raises the vapor pressure, so they get whatever the mm -hmm. atmospheric pressure is, but the other way to do it is to lower the, the uh, atmospheric pressure, and that's actually, have you ever heard, ever heard about things being freeze-dried? To mm -hmm. freeze dry, and that's how they do it. They actually cool. lower that vapor cool. pressure because we couldn't show it to you because of the problems I had here. But the temperature actually went down 30 degrees when that started wow. to boil. Wow. Okay, because boiling is a, you know, we've got to put heat in, and that heat was used to boil it even though we weren't adding any heat, mm -hmm. made the temperature go down. So, Caleb, you did a great job. Congratulations. Great but job. But don't forget, Kate. every correct response goes in our Homer Hotline Hall of Fame. Earn enough points, and you can win a tablet at the end of the season. That was a great job. That's all that we have time for tonight. Next week on Homework Hotline, we'll be focused on a March Madness. It's begun. Yes, it's it has. Yes. Bye, guys. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIC, working for communities across New York State.